Christ did not come to a people unprepared for his coming. God had prepared the people of Israel throughout a long, winding path full of sin over many centuries. But even in Israel's brokenness, our Lord's faithfulness and how he spoke to them through the prophets and the sacrifices of the Old Testament prepared for his coming. They were unfaithful, but he was faithful. God also prepared for his coming more immediately through the sending of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the last and the greatest of the prophets. He prepared the people for the coming of Christ, both by announcing his immediate coming as well as by bringing them to repentance. The baptism that John the Baptist administered is not Christian baptism. It did not have the full effect of what we have now. As John the Baptist himself remarks, his baptism is with water, but the baptism of Christ, that has the Holy Spirit as well. In Christian baptism, we are freed from our sins, but we're also given grace and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of John the Baptist did help to bring about repentance in addition to foreshadowing Christian baptism. Moreover, when people came to John the Baptist, they acknowledged their sins aloud, and they turned away from them. This acknowledgement of our sins and then setting our will to turn away from them, this is the heart of repentance. It removes the obstacle that sin places in our hearts. While sin does not bring about our physical death, at least not immediately, it makes it harder for us to reach Christ. John the Baptist was given the mission of making straight the paths, of making the winding routes due to changes in elevation that people had to take straight and fast because sin is an obstacle to Christ. Sin prevents us from being able to reach our destination. In mortal sin, we are completely stopped. But in venial sin, we can still reach our destination of Christ. But the process takes longer. The paths are winding. The fastest route is blocked, and so we have to take a detour, go a longer distance, and wait in traffic at an intersection that's not designed for this level of traffic. The removal of sin from our hearts through baptism, as prefigured by the washing that John the Baptist did, or through the sacrament of confession, prefigured by the acknowledgement of sin that these people made, removes this obstacle, and it enables us to reach what is our true destination, Christ. And not only did John the Baptist prepare the people for Christ by removing the obstacles to them obtaining Christ, that is, their sins, John the Baptist 
pointed to Christ. And he pointed to Christ as something, as someone far greater than him. John the Baptist says of Christ, this is one mightier than I who is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thongs of his sandals. If John the Baptist were merely, as he might appear to us at first glance, some crazy dude in the desert with a weird diet and even stranger clothes, this wouldn't be all that great to be mightier than John the Baptist. But no, John the Baptist, if we look at him through the eyes of the people of the time, and particularly if we look at him through the eyes of faith, can be seen as a personification of the prophets and the priesthood of the Old Testament. John the Baptist performed the ministry of a prophet. He recalled the promises of God to his people and reminded them of these and in turn exhorted them to be faithful. This is a task of a prophet. But also, his clothing, camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, to us seems quite strange. But while these clothes were strange to the time, they had a particular meaning. These were the clothes worn by the greatest of the prophets, Elijah. And so, in his wearing of them, which Mark reminds us of, we see in John the Baptist the new Elijah, who will announce the coming of the Lord, and indeed, later in the Gospel, John the Baptist will be spoken of both by others and by Christ as Elijah, because he's fulfilling Elijah's ministry. But also, John the Baptist was the fulfillment of the priesthood and sacrifices of the Old Testament. John the Baptist was a priest of the Old Testament. When we hear of his conception in Luke, it is because his father is ministering as a priest in the temple. That is when the angel Gabriel appears to him. And so we know from this that John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was a priest of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the priesthood was passed not by the laying on of the hands of a bishop through ordination, but rather from father to son. And so, simply by virtue of being the son of Zechariah, John the Baptist was an Old Testament priest. But also, details of his life cast him as the new Samuel, one who is the fulfillment of the greatest priest of the Old Testament. Like Samuel's mother, Hananiah, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was old, barren, and childless. But she prayed to God for a child. And the Lord heard the prayer of both Hananiah and Elizabeth. Similarly, Samuel, by virtue of his mother's fulfillment of the vow she made in rejoicing at this great gift, was a Nazarite. No razor would touch 
his head. So too do we hear of John the Baptist also being a Nazarite, for he would not drink wine or strong drink as recorded in Luke. Similarly, not only were they both Nazarites, but they were dedicated to God by their parents in celebration of their birth. And the highest point of Samuel's ministry was anointing David the king with oil. And so too, the high point of John the Baptist's ministry was anointing the son of David, Christ, not with oil, but with water at Christ's baptism. In this way, the prophets and the priesthood of the Old Testament welcome Christ as their fulfillment, as the one who is mightier than them. But John the Baptist was a great and noble figure. So too were the prophets and priesthood of the Old Covenant, even though compared to the greatness of what we have in Christ, they pale in comparison.